takes place, okay? We're getting down to where, where I want to get into now tonight. Um, life and death are in the power of the tongue. Proverbs tells us, they that love it will eat the fruit thereof. So we have to understand that there is there, there must be a preaching that takes place, okay? Um, you say, well, Pastor Mark, I'm not a preacher, but I beg to differ. I believe every one of us are called to preach the gospel. Amen. You may not all be called the fivefold ministry. You may not all be a pastor or a teacher or, or a, a, an evangelist, you know, a prophet and apostle, but we're all preachers of the gospel. Every one of us Amen. are. Amen. Every one of us are. Okay, so we've got to clear that up. We got because there was this misconception for years uh, that that well, you know, you're called to preach and you're not called to preach. But it, but and I understand what we meant by that. But I think that it kind of created a little bit of confusion because what we should be doing is training and equipping everyone to go out and share the gospel. Amen. Right? Amen. Doesn't mean you got to stand up here and preach to 150 or 200 people. Uh, it doesn't always necessarily translate into that. But just preaching is just declaring the Word. Right. It's declaring the Word of God. It's knowing the Word of God yes. good enough, having enough depth in your life to declare it and to speak it out of your mouth, Amen. all right? Um, as I looked up the word sermon. I just wanted to see what the dictionary said, and it said a religious discourse delivered as part of a church service. <laughs> a religious discourse delivered as part of a church service. They must have been talking about me, an often lengthy and tedious speech of reproof or exhortation. Uh, <laughs> I was talking to a friend of mine, and this this has been a couple years ago, and this guy's a really good friend of mine, but he's he he's like he was in Bible college at the time. So he was sitting under the tutelage of professors, you know, and doctors and and he had all this, you know, much learning was driving him mad. <laughs> he would sit down with me and he would talk to me and bounce stuff off of me. He came up with this theory one time, and he said that we preach way too much in church nowadays. And, and he said, uh, he went on further, and he was explaining that a sermon cannot change a life. Right. He said a sermon cannot change a life. And he said, uh, in fact, he, he believed that Jesus never preached outside of that one sermon on the mount, is what he said. And so I just sat and listened to him, let him talk for a little bit. And I, and I finally, and he, you know, he finally took a breath, gave me time to in, get some words edgewise in. And I said, you know what? I said, first of all, Jesus was the Word made flesh, okay? So everywhere he went, everything that he said was a sermon. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was a Word deposited, okay? Uh, everything that he did and said, we're feeding on it today. Amen. We're still looking at it today and breaking it down today. He was the bread of life. Uh, and he wanted to know if, I, if that meant I disagreed with his statement. And I said, yeah, just a little bit. I said, now, now listen, if it's just a sermon we're talking about and just a speech, I'm not convinced that that's all that's necessary. Although when you look back in history, there have been some inspiring speeches right. that made history, right? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Martin Luther yeah. King Jr.'s speech will always go down in history. We'll always remember that and be able to quote various parts of that, and some of us, all of it, right? Yeah. Uh, there were great men have given great speeches down through history, okay? Uh, uh, but actually, his I've listened to him. I've, I've actually listened to the recording of him giving that. That wasn't a speech. That man was preaching that day. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he was preaching. That was a that was a word that he was delivering that day. And, and so, uh, I mean, I could feel the anointing on it when I was listening to it. So it wasn't just a speech. But there are a lot of people that can give speeches, okay? But if that's all we're talking about, that's one thing. But there is a difference, though, in giving a sermon or giving a speech and then making a deposit. And I don't see myself as someone who preaches sermons. And I never have. I don't always see myself as someone who teaches lessons either. What I see myself as is somebody who stands up and makes a spiritual deposit into the people that are listening to me. Now, there's a difference right there, okay? And, and because of that, I put a great deal of responsibility on myself. Whenever I know I'm going to preach, I will study 8, 10, 12 hours just to get up here for one hour and talk to somebody, to talk to you folks. I put a lot of time and study into it. And even when I don't have anywhere to preach, I'll still study and just get ready for when I do have somewhere to preach. And I'll just stockpile stuff, you know, put stuff back and just feed myself so that I can just get up and just God will just let it rip, you know. Uh, but but that's because I don't see my... Now, if I was just somebody who got up and preached sermons, I could just download sermons. There are websites to do it from. There's one called DesperatePreacher.com. There's another one called sermon, SermonCentral.com. 
And I'll tell you how I found out about these, because when I, when I was pastoring, the sermons that I never really liked to preach were Mother's Day, Father's Day, and different things where it was expected to say a certain thing that day. I struggled. Now, I'm better at it now, but when I first started preaching, I struggled. Uh, because I, I was like, you know what, I'm going to say the same thing I said last year on Mother's Day. And so I, you know, I struggled. So I started looking for other preacher sermons to see what they had to say, to see if there's anything I could pull from this one and that one and put it all in there with mine too, you know. And so I found that, I mean, if you just, there are books on how to outline sermons. There are books that have sermons in them. But that's not me, and I'm not knocking that if you do that. But uh, with me, I dig in and pray about where I'm preaching and say, God, what is it that you have to speak to that body? What word do you want to deposit down on the inside of them that will take root and grow and cause transformation to take place there? And then I'll wait in my spirit, and usually within minutes or within hours, he, all of a sudden, I'll, I might be, have gotten up from that prayer and go about my day or whatever, and then all of a sudden something drops in my spirit, and all of a sudden I can't think about nothing but that the rest of the day. A lot of times he even tips me off that I'm going to preach. There are times where I'm at work, don't even know that I'm supposed to be preaching, but all but God has put something in me and it's rolling around in my spirit and I'm like, man, this is this must be for something coming up. And then uh, then just the most recent time, I was on my way home from work that evening and a pastor called me, said I'm sick and uh, I had an, an associate minister who was supposed to cover for me tonight and he backed out and he said, um, can you preach tonight? And I, I only had three hours notice and he said, I hate to do that to you and I said, that's all right, man. I said, God kind of tipped me off today. He gave me something that's been rolling around. I just didn't know who it was for or where it was going to be preached. But see, I mean, that's just, that's just God, okay? This, I'm not talking about me here. What I'm talking about is the word delivered. And I know your pastors are the same way because I've known them. I've gotten to know them very well over the last few years. And so I know that we, there, there are ministers who pray and seek God, and then they get up and they make a deposit. Pastor Raymond's one of those as well. Pastor Graham is. Um, the word of God, though, is rich. It's alive. It's powerful. And what I'm declaring to you is that if you'll receive God's word into your life with meekness, yes. it, will, it, it will redirect you. It will redefine you. It will inspire you or motivate you. T.D. Jakes told a bunch of ministers one time, it will impregnate you. Yeah. It will make you pregnant. And, and he said, and then you'll get pregnant and you'll carry that thought around in you and that thing will grow in you. And you'll get around other people who have one and they'll, they'll make your baby kick. And I, I knew what he was talking about because I've carried stuff on on the inside of me before and then got around other ministers and felt that same thing about them. And it's just like when Elizabeth and Mary met up and the baby leapt in the womb because they could, he could feel the anointing there. And, and uh, see, the Gospels were full. And I finally told my friend, the Gospels were full of references to Jesus traveling throughout the regions preaching the Gospel of the Kingdom. Now, the Sermon on the Mount is the only one that's broke down and given three chapters, okay, and really broke down in great detail to us, but he traveled everywhere preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Then Acts tells us that the apostles went out anointed by God, and they too preached the gospel everywhere they went. In fact, one verse says that they turned their world upside down with the preaching of the gospel, amen? amen. So, uh, you can't let your familiarity with me breed contempt or cause you to relax your guard and think, well, this is just this is just Mark. This is just Pastor Jerry or just Sister Sydney, you know, or you can't you, you gotta lay all that stuff aside and anytime anyone is up here, even if it's the young man, is that Gabe? Gabe up here a while ago reading the word like that. It doesn't matter who it is. When someone stands up here and reads the word of God, they could be anointed to make a deposit in somebody right then and there. Amen. So we have to never be so dismissive of it and never be so casual where we say, well, that's just my pastor. They know what we're going through. They know what we're facing. It's not about them. It's about what they are saying and the anointing that's on what they are saying. Yeah. They're speaking the word of God. They're depositing it and it's anointed. Amen. So that's what it's about, right? Yeah. We know that the Apostle Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. We also know that he had a deep revelation of the mystery of the church. And, uh, you know, the, the covenant and non-covenant coming together. And we, he had such a tremendous revelation. It would be exciting to have Paul stop by and share his insight with us in person. 
It really would, right? But you know, people even fell asleep when he preached. People fell asleep even when Paul preached. There's one story that says that Paul was preaching one night and he went long up to after the midnight hour. So uh, you think I'm long-winded. I don't know when their service started, but he preached up till after the midnight hour. And a young man named Eutychus was sitting in the window sill, and he began to doze off. And he fell asleep and fell out of the window and died. <laughs> fell down to the ground and died. And they had to go down there and lay hands on him. Paul laid hands on him, and he came back to life. Amen. <laughs> so... Uh, did he fall to his death because Paul was a boring preacher? <laughs> really, it was just physics. There was more of him on the outside of the window than there was on the inside. <laughs> That's all there was to it, right? Sometimes We can't be exciting all the time. I mean, none of us, even the best preacher, the best minister, every now and then is just going to get up and hit one to first base. <laughs> it can't be a home run every time we get up here. I mean, sometimes we're going to mess up, right? And Paul even had folks dozing off in his sermons. Um, but the, the truth of the matter was, Paul had been preaching a long time, but in his defense, he was about to board a ship the next morning and leave, and he didn't know he would ever see them again. Because the things the Lord had been showing him, so he was setting them down and was making a deposit in their life that he felt was very significant. Okay? And uh, undoubtedly, Paul felt like he needed to share that with his, that local body before he left. All right? Eutychus simply got a little distracted and a little tired and became overwhelmed, amen, and fell. <laughs> but, but let me ask you this, okay? What is it that distracts you? Well, boy, it gets quiet fast. <laughs> In your life, when God is wanting to talk to you and get your attention, what is it that distracts you? You can tell us, Lizzie. pretty much life. I mean, at her age, that's her life. That's the, yeah. that's the consistency of her life. Homework and chores and doing assignments and taking care of those responsibilities. Uh, there, there is, I mean, what is it that comes into our life that causes us to be sleepy at the significant moments in our life? When God would want to make a deposit in us, when God would want to make a spiritual deposit in us, what would cause someone to miss a Kairos moment in their life? You know what a Kairos moment is? Kairos in ancient, is a, it's an ancient Greek word, meaning the right or opportune moment. The ancient Greeks had two words for time, chronos and kairos. Uh, the former one, chronos, refers to chronological time uh, or sequential time, and the latter, though, refers to a time in between, a moment of undetermined period of time in which something special happens. A kairos moment is a, an undetermined and unknown moment in period of time through in which something special happens. What the special something is depends on who is using the word. While Kronos speaks of quantity, Kairos speaks of quality. Quality, okay? So is it procrastination that causes us to miss a Kairos moment in our lives? Is it laziness or lethargy? Is it complacency? Is it distraction? And as Lizzie shared with us tonight, sometimes the distractions are legitimate, they are things that have to be done, but we just have to learn to prioritize and make the most important things first, and then we just have to better manage our time. Now, I'll be honest with you, I'm not real good at that yet. I'm getting better, but I'm one of those who uh, is easily distracted, <laughs> you know, and I'll be studying and, and praying and something shiny jumps in front of me, and all of a sudden I lost my train of thought. You know, and so I, I'm one of the worst ones about it. So I really have had to learn to train myself. Um, in, in Greek mythology, though, Kairos was actually, now I'm, I'm just sharing th mythology with you to help you understand where the word came from, where it originated, okay? I don't believe in Greek mythology. But uh, it, it was, uh, it meant the God of the fleeting moment. The God of the fleeting moment. Uh, there was a bronze statue of Kairos sculpted, and this was written on the statue, okay? This was what the artist wrote on it. Who and whence was the sculptor from Sicyon? And his name, Lysippus. And who are you? The answer, time who subdues all things. Why do you stand on tiptoe? Because I am ever running. And why have you a pair of wings on your feet? Because I fly with the wind. And why do you hold a razor in your right hand? 
as a sign to men that I am sharper than any sharp edge. And why does your hair hang over your face? Now get this, okay? For him who meets me to take me by the forelock. And why in heaven's name is the back of your head bald? Because none whom I have once raced by on my winged feet will now, though he wish it sore, take hold of me from behind. Why did the artist fashion you? For your sake, stranger. And he set me up in the porch as a lesson. It's interesting. It's interesting. So it describes the hair all growing out to the front. So when you meet Kairos face to face, you can grab a hold of, of the hair. But once it's past you, there's nothing to grab a hold of. Right? Uh, Kairos means seeing the opportune moment and striking through that moment with force to accomplish the task. It's what we call seizing the moment, right? 